Uh, as many have pointed out, this album seems to be the ending of a trilogy that Drake started with CLB. As the last three titles kind of line up to uh, make a sentence that will soon become every 14 year old white boy's next Instagram caption, I was a certified lover boy, but honestly, never mind. It's her loss. Now that it has finally been a little bit over a week, and I've had time to let her loss marinate a bit more and re listen to Certified Lover Boy and Honestly Never Mind again, I think I'm finally equipped to talk about the albums that form what I'm calling the Lover Boy trilogy. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see if the BBL6 god himself has finally redeemed himself. This video is a bit of a continuation of my series of Drake videos that I've been doing, so if you want like a full context and understanding of my feelings on Drake and his music over the last few years, then I would suggest watching my last two Drake videos. Once again, I know I'm potentially asking you to dedicate two hours of your life to watch my videos, but um... They're really good, guys. They're, they're, they're like really, really good. Since most of you won't watch the initial video anyway, I'm going to be doing a retelling of my opinions on the last two Drake projects that I reviewed in that video, as they were the latest at the time, and talk about the checklist and narrative of each, explaining how they are loosely connected. Plus, my opinions have changed a bit since then, so I will have some better or worse things to say. And I'm going to keep the little introductory videos because that was one of my favorite parts of the jungle. boy where it all started one of drake's most highly anticipated releases to this day this project has continued to grow on me let's get through a bit of the filler some stereotypical braggadocious drake tracks include champagne poetry a banger intro flexing his wealth and his son poppy's home a song where drake claims that he is better than everybody in the rap game and also has a waste of a Nicki minaj appearance there's way too sexy a song that i will defend to this day it's just a fun summer song that doesn't need to be taken so seriously knife talk where drake just tells us how hard he is and about his apparent shooters <laughs> Drake's the strongest rapper I know so and you only live twice which acts as not only a sequel to the song the motto from take care but is in all honesty a, a poor man's attempt at an old school collab between Jersey Wayne and Rick Ross then there is girls want girls with little baby a song that is Drake and little baby is somewhat problematic ode to lesbian women where Drake also begins his coming out story as a bisexual man and of course utters one of the greatest lines in rap history yeah say that you a lesbian girl me too you also have some diss tracks, mainly aimed at then-rival Kanye West or Ye, like No Friends in the Industry and 7am on Bridal Path. Then we got some more reflective tracks, like Fair Trade with Travis Scott, a song denouncing fake friends for inner peace, I Miss You Too with Kid Cudi, a song about growing up and improving as a person, and Cudi and Jersey ending their long-running beef, and then the album's conclusion, The Remorse, thanking those who have been with him since the beginning. But we don't care about those songs. Uh, let's get to the main narrative of the album, and the three albums preceding it, Women. This kicks off with In the Bible, with Lil Durk and Giveon, a song where Drake and Giveon explain that the actions of some women in their life hurt them. Durk, on the other hand, is actually very happy and in love with his girlfriend, India Royale, and I'm sure that their relationship will be just f Oh. Whoops. Or Love All with Jay-Z, where Drake laments that his fame can be his worst enemy at times, ranking that even women in the industry were using him, throwing potential shots at Old Flames, Georgia Smith, or Rihanna. Then there is TSU, a song where Drake raps about a stripper that he might have had a fling with that wants to leave stripping to become a businesswoman, and Drake vows to give her financial support as her parents cut her off. It kind of echoes the real her from Take Care. This is where we start to see a bit of lover boy Drake coming out. Then we get into Deep with Future, a two-part song. In the first part, a sober where Drake enters the club with a woman trying to convince her that you know he's a good man and he's going above and beyond to gain her affection. And then in the second part, Drake in a potentially inebriated state, having a lot of fun in the club and having a lot of fun with this woman, starts remarking to this girl that he was never in love with any of the other girls around him. And, and then at the end, realizing that he might have regretted saying that, remarking that he might be in too deep. <laughs> get it then we get to what is easily the best song on this project and a top 10 drake song pipe down or drake laments a broken relationship that he did everything to save but utterly failed and is left heartbroken trying his best to get over them certified fucking banger then there's a bit of a break with the song Yeba's Heartbreak by Yeba, a gut-wrenching song where Yeba sings about her love for her mother who took her own life in 2016 saying that she cares for her and loves her despite any of the stress or worries that she may have been facing it's it's truly heartbreaking. Then we get to Race My Mind, a song where Drake sings about how he feels neglected in a relationship. And then we make a complete 180 with the next two tracks. Fountains with Tem is a dance hall song all about how Drake and Tems are in love with somebody. That's really it. But then there's Get Along Better with Ty Dolla Sign, a song where after the ending of a relationship where the girl was seemingly afraid to commit, Drake starts getting with his ex's friend. According to Drake, not out of spite or revenge, but just because he 
gets along better with them. Okay, Drake. And then this cycle finally ends with the penultimate track, Fucking Fans, where Drake laments and admits guilt for having sex with fans, neglecting his relationship with the woman in the song, and how he had his unplanned son, Adonis. All of that driving a larger wedge between them. This song has been rumored by many to be about his very, very public old flame, Rihanna, as certain lyrics seem to reference some events that we'll come back to later. But the album narratively paints a picture of a somewhat arrogant Drake. Drake would rap about having his heart broken or being neglected in songs like In the Bible, Race My Mind, and Pipe Down, songs that kind of paint himself as a person in the right or in the case of tsu painting himself as kind of a savior but then on songs that get along better and fucking fans he takes full ownership for his toxic behaviors as the relationships have fallen or proceeded to fall and we even see how he was afraid to commit on in too deep after getting what he really wanted a theme that does return in this trilogy this highlights the detriments of drake being a lover boy you know he can have all the sex that he wants and he's been telling us that forever that with his money his fame and his conventional attractiveness it makes sense as to why he would be a lover boy, but being one can only get you so far as Drake struggles to maintain a more personal connection with, with a woman rather than a physical one. A well done and introspective narrative actually, if done correctly. Certified lover boy felt like he was moving all over the place, and, and I'm not saying that the album can only stick to the lover boy narrative, but some of the switches felt very abrupt. Going from such a depressing song like Yeva's Heartbreak to No Friends in the Industry was jarring and didn't make sense. Plus, throughout the tracklist, Drake is flip-flopping between being in love or attracted to a woman or being heartbroken. It doesn't flow the best. My initial takes from the Jungle video still stand. It is leagues better than Scorpion, but it, it failed to live up to expectations once again. Drake had the opportunity to make a more thought-provoking piece where he tells the world that he is a heavily flawed human being, and it felt way more like Drake was just focused on making songs that he knew would be popular, rather than being more passionate about the work he's putting in. It has grown on me, but only a little bit. This project still gets a 7.3 for me. But from this point, coincidentally, nine months after the release of CLB, we get I don't wanna Honestly, never mind. And in contrast to CLB, there's virtually no filler on this project. Out of 13 tracks on this album, not counting the instrumental intro that leads into track two, 11 songs are about Drake's relationship with this woman. And the other two, Sticky and Jimmy Cooks of 21, are just some regular like braggadocious Drake tracks. But starting with the narrative first, we have Falling Back, a song where Drake feels like the effort that he's putting into a relationship isn't being reciprocated. Then there's Text Go Green, a song where Drake realizing that he is in a toxic relationship decides the best thing to do is to block this girl and get her out of his life, making her text bubbles on his iPhone go green. Then, on Currents, Drake once again talks about a toxic relationship on the rocks as they both fail to be able to communicate with each other. Then, on A Keeper, despite what the title might suggest, Drake questions why he keeps her around despite their relationship clearly being on the rocks. Then, somewhat answers that question in Calling My Name where he says that, well, the chorus kind of gives it away. Your pussy. Is calling my name. Then, on the voguing anthem that is massive, Drake is pleading that he can fix their troubles and continue to try and be together. And then on Fight's book, he seems to try and do the same thing, convince her that, you know, they shared some good times not to give up so soon. Then, we get to Overdrive, a song where basically Drake is on his knees at this point, begging that this woman stays with him. And after that, we get the somewhat reflective downhill, where Drake realizes that they seemingly had a great relationship over last summer, but within one night, the disconnect between them began to grow. In this song, us some much needed insight and confirmation of the woman that Drake is most likely referring to during this trilogy. Very clearly, Rihanna, as a similar issue seems to arise in fucking fans from CLB. This third verse of fucking fans references a night in Vegas where Drake and Riri seem to get into an argument of some sort, and apparently locked her out of the hotel room since it was apparently getting heated. A real event that did happen that was captured by a fan photo where Drake and Rihanna were spotted at a party in Vegas, but it was heavily rumored that they got into a major argument that eventually led to them splitting. And Drake also says once again that they had a good summer, but it all fell apart after one night. Summer 2016 was huge for them, with them both collaborating and seemingly dating, and also releasing their mega hit albums and songs with Too Good From Views and Work From Anti, and it all seemed to collapse once the summer ended in Vegas, as we literally hear in New Year's Day in 2017 that he somewhat took some shots at Reed at a party, skipping over the song Work during a DJ set, saying that he wanted to move on to newer things. <sighs> 
king of king of fucking pettiness, confirming that this entire trilogy is most likely about Rihanna. Then on the tie that binds, Drake once again is on his knees begging that they don't call it quits. But finally on the penultimate track, Liability, Drake finally concludes that he's tired of letting his heart get played and decides to just end it then and there. Narrative wise, honestly never mind fixed the pacing issue that asserted by Loverboy had. The fall of the relationship with Rihanna seems to happen track by track, with only a brief intermission with Sticky and the album ending with what feels like more of a bonus track with Jimmy Cooks. Instead of the high on life, arrogant Drake from the last album, he has become way more open with his emotions and laments how his relationship continued to wither away as he tried all he could to save it. This is easily Drake's most like emotionally open album and I feel like that's an aspect of it that goes underappreciated. I just wish the music was like good. <laughs> what Drake made up for with the narrative, he phoned it in with the music. Like I said in the Jungle video and my first impressions video, I can applaud Drake for trying something new, making an entire dancehall album, but the music itself felt super half-assed, and it just did feel like Drake was trying to capitalize on Beyonce's upcoming revival of mainstream dancehall. Aside from the obvious hits and some of my guilty pleasures on the track list, the songs were nothing special. Tracks like Overdrive and Downhill were mad fucking boring, and Liability sounds like one of those 432 hertz slowed plus reverb edits of popular songs and feels kind of goofy. Could have easily made this a way more R&B focused album, maybe throwing in some features from people like Brent Fias, and this could have been an amazing step into Drake trying to experiment with his sound, but instead he lets himself fall on the crutch of production to make one of the most uninspired pieces yet, right in front of Thank Me Later and Scorpion. After the re-listen, the album gets a lower, flat 6 out of 10. But after this, finally came the final piece in ending this Drake trilogy. In 21, can you do something for me? Can you talk to the ops next for me? In 21, do your thing, 21, do your thing. Her loss with 21 Savage. Now, despite the album being labeled as a collaboration album, this is way more of a Drake project with 21 featured on the majority of the track list. For example, uh, the song Hours in Silence, 21 has one verse on a song that is over six and a half minutes long, and the verse lasts for 30 seconds. And out of a 16 song track list, Drake has four solo songs, while 21 only has one. So out of the 16, around 69%, haha, is the actual collab part. But I'm gonna take a bit of a break from the narrative and focus a bit more on the music itself. The album starts off with a Take Keith produced Rich Flex, the song that spawned the most iconic Drake line from this project. In 21, can you do something for me? Like marking the return of BBO Drake and the meme surrounding him. Uh, jokes aside, this is a pretty decent introduction to this project. The majority of the songs in this project are these high energy bangers. The first three songs afterward are no different. Major Distribution, On Bullshit, a song where Drake also says, I blow a half a million on you hoes. I'm a feminist. I never thought that hoes and feminists could go in the same sentence, but okay. And then Back Outside Boys, a Drake solo track, are all some bangers and had me genuinely excited to keep listening. Except for that long ass outro on On Bullshit or with Arthur Carr. This nigga's monologue goes on for a full fucking minute. Oh my god, shut the fuck up. Then we take a bit of a tonal shift for the next three songs. Privileged Rappers, a song which is a bit more reflective as Drake and 21 reflect on how they had to work hard to get the success that they had, and they believe that many rappers nowadays just get that opportunity handed to them. And he also says this, once again reiterating that he is clearly bisexual and relating to his fellow bisexual bestie Frank Ocean. And then there is a song where Drake continues spreading his messages of feminism. <laughs> stupid joke. With Spin About You, a song where Drake and 21 rap about how they would do anything for this particular woman, or Drake's verse opens with lines about the overturning of Roe v. Wade and how it's, well, bad. But Drake didn't say that line because he avidly cares for women's rights. He definitely said that because he was just, he was, he was definitely in the studio just thinking, the hoes will love this one. At the very least, at least he's spitting facts. Next, here's one of my personal highlights, Hours in Silence. A song that gives me a similar vibe to come through from Nothing Was The Same. They both have a similar structure. Drake wants a link with a girl, but when the beat switch happens, feelings from this girl go from excitement to pure dread. As in Hours of Silence, this apparent girl seems to be running around telling lies about Drake, ruining people's perception of him and also breaking his heart in the process, repeatedly telling her that she was lost before they got together. And after that, we get the, in my opinion, forgettable treacherous twins, which the subject matter sounds exactly like you think it would. And then we get the most controversial song from this project, Circo Loco, a song that disses Rival, again, yay, fair enough, and Megan Thee Stallion, kind of out of nowhere. And something that I'm starting to recognize now is that that line that was most definitely an attack on Megan, 
what Yachty was most likely referring to in his IG Live was just explaining part of a double entendre because there's no way in hell Drake did not know how that would sound. Aside from that, pretty good track. The Daft Punk sample was pretty nice, but it does definitely sound like a Baby Tron beat, except in this case, for once, it's, you know, it's actually a fucking cleared sample. Ooh, shit, that's a Danny G beat. I just made one make sports center. I don't fight girls, but I'm a whore hitter. Then we get my favorite song from the project, Pussy and Millions with Mr. LaFlame himself. Nothing to say except it, this was a fucking banger. Same thing with Brooke Boys, another fire braggadocious track that makes me want to look down upon poor people despite working a minimum wage job. Then we get the reflective and somewhat braggadocious Middle of the Ocean, a solo track where Trick just sits back and admires his lavish lifestyle, and also calls Serena Williams' husband a groupie? I, di I didn't realize that loving your wife and child made you a groupie, but... Okay. Then, there's the filthy produced Jumbotron shit poppin'. Another solo track where Drake once again flexes his sexual prowess and how women like to fuck him and also pays homage to Playboy Cardi. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, thank you, Cardi. Then, there was the final collab track, More M's, a song that feels like a waste of a Metro Boomin' beat, where Drake proves us again how masculine he is and throws some subliminals at Kendrick Lamar. The control verse was nine years ago, Drake. Grow the fuck up, bruh. And then there are the last two songs. 3AM on Glenwood, a savage-only track that pays homage to the time and location series of songs that Drake has been doing since the early 2010s, with the first, of course, being 9AM in Dallas, where Savage just reflects on his hometown and how it shaped him to be the person that he is now. And then we get the final track on the album, I Guess It's Fuck Me, a somber, slow, self-reflective Drake track where he grieves the imminent death of a relationship leading to his lover, what did I do wrong? Asking her for closure and some forgiveness, admitting that he feels guilty about something that he did. And, and with that, the album ends. And I will definitely return to that song later, but for now, I want to complain about some of the issues I have with the music on this album, which I'm actually happy to say is few and far in between. First of all, the fucking beat switches. Some of them kind of fuck up the vibe of the song. It's like they saw Jimmy Cook's production, saw the success with that song, and just decided to do that for a good amount of the track list. Not all of them are like bad per se, but like they didn't seem super necessary. For me, beat switches need to follow four rules. They need to be unexpected, they need to complement the pre-existing beat, they have to feel deserved, and it has to be able to change the vibe of the song. For example, a song that follows these rules the best is definitely sicko mode. It has three main beats, and each of them adding its own flair to the song, making it incredibly unique and marking the song as one of the most iconic rap songs of the 2010s. In this project, the beat switches are so overused that they felt gimmicky at a certain point. The songs that used them were fine for the most part, but just they just felt unnecessary. The song Broke Boys comes to mind in this conversation. The beat starts off with this menacing reversing beat from Wheezy, and then it switches over to this lower tier take Keith beat where the vibe is completely changed, but it doesn't feel welcome. This feels like this should be a separate song. I still like the song, but it still felt unnecessary, especially at this point in the track list already hearing four songs with beat switches. And the second and final real complaint is just how this album kind of lacks collaboration. For something that they were labeling a collab album, they kind of phoned it in for the collab part. According to Hip Hop by the Numbers, Drake spoke for 66% of the album, whereas 21 rapped for at least 26%, leaving the last 8% to guests. And the only features are Travis's verse on Pussy in millions, Lil Yachty's ad libs on songs, and I guess like intros from like Young Nudie and that annoying ass Arthur Carr outro, if you can even count those. With collaboration projects, as Sean C pointed out, they shine when the, when the artist offers something that you can only get from a real collaboration. Kid Sea Ghost is a really good example of that. Ye and Kid Cudi at this point had more different and established styles, and they blended them together for their seven track masterpieces. You couldn't get a song like Feel the Love with just a measly feature. You <laughs> you really couldn't. But in this one, it feels like 21 was just featured on a bunch of Drake songs and they just said, collab album. More M's is the only song that feels different than the rest, but to me it's kind of bland. Very clearly feels like a Savage Mode 2 throwaway since they realize that 21 has to meet a quota of at least one Metro Boomin beat on its projects. But this lack of collab is a bit of a double-edged sword. As without it, we wouldn't have been able to finish off this trilogy if it wasn't a primarily Drake-focused album. The narrative of this album is vastly different from the last two. This one is mainly filled with more flexing, whether it be wealth or sexual prowess, but I feel like that works well with with the whole her loss thing. This kind of wraps up this arc in a neat little bow. If you don't count Jimmy Cooks as the real album outro and more of a bonus track, honestly never mind ends with Drake officially cutting ties with Riri, being in emotional turmoil for a long time, and then her loss immediately picks up with a song called Rich Flex, where 21 and Drake, well, 
Flex, among other things. And the first few tracks are braggadocious, and then the vibe changes with the song Spin About You and Hours of Silence. Spin About You is a love song, and Hours of Silence starts off as a love song, but slowly transitions into a way more bitter and upset Drake, rapping about his issues with this girl. And then after that, which is back to braggadocious Drake flexing his wealth, his OVO goons, and all that stuff, and taking shots at other rappers. Jumbotron shit poppin' is literally about how he can, he says that he can easily get women to fuck him and do ecstasy with him. But then then the album ends with I Guess It's Fuck Me, a track where Drake pleads to know what he did wrong so that he and Rick can get back together, but it unfortunately falls on deaf ears. This is genuinely the best outro to this trilogy I could have asked for. It wraps it up so neatly. I think the concept for this trilogy most definitely came after Drake found out that rapper ASAP Rocky, someone who Drake did collab with, made the 2012 hit fucking problems together and they were seemingly on good terms the latter part of the last decade, was dating Rihanna. In Act 1, or CLB, which came out a year after we got public confirmation that Rocky and Rick were together, Drake is a somewhat arrogant person. He constantly talks about how he has, you know, all the sex and money he could ever ask for thanks to his talents, his business, and his conventional attractiveness, but at the same time fails to find a woman to properly settle down with. And in those brief, and I mean brief, moments of self-reflection, Drake recognizes that he is a very big reason as to why his relationships seem to fall apart, ending with fucking fans, exclaiming that he was trying to better himself, but he ultimately knows where he fucked up, showing us that being a lover boy isn't all it's cracked up to be. Then, in Act 2, or honestly never mind, which came out five months after Rocky and Reed revealed that they were expecting a child, Drake's attitude shifted as he is in full heartbreak mode, spending the majority of the album instead of being more open and self-reflective on how he contributed to the downfall of their relationship, he's more focused on Ree's own shortcomings in their relationship, initially wanting to cut things off, but then spends the last half of the album pleading for things not to end, only for this to again fall on deaf ears, making him want to leave. And then in Act 3, Drake at this point is trying his best to remind himself that, you know, he's successful on his own and doesn't need her, making him making him a lot more arrogant and over prideful than, his, than on the last two albums. But then when, as we get back to the closing track, despite all of the flexing, expensive houses and beautiful women in his life, there's still a hole left in his heart, made by Rihanna, the one that got away. Beginning a toxic, perpetual cycle that Drake has never been able to break, including the trilogy and starting the cycle again. You know, for once, I feel like I can, give, I can give Drake his props. This is a beautifully crafted narrative that has been intricately woven between these last three albums. And for some of you that believe that I might be grasping at straws, I don't think the conclusions that I'm drawing are too far-fetched. Drake has tried some more intricate and unique storytelling before. Drake's 2016 studio album, Views, was a concept album about the changing seasons in Toronto, starting with winter, where we get these more colder-feeling Drake songs that keep the family close, then into the summer with more chipper and upbeat songs like One Dance and Controller, and then back to winter again with the last two tracks on the album. And despite me not being the biggest fan of views, it was a cool idea, and it did seem to work well narrative-wise. So yeah, for once in a long time, I feel like I can give Drake his props a bit. Has he gotten off the hook yet? No. There still appears to be some shortcomings in his work. Despite the well-done story, the actual music is keeping me from becoming somebody like Los Pollos TV or DJ Meat Rider. I still think that Drake's music has been lacking some passion over the last couple years, and I still do worry that he will never make it back to his former glory, but after her loss, I can say that for, for the first time in a while, I felt pretty satisfied. Not the greatest piece of art in the world or anything, but a nice step in the right direction. Certified Loverboy gets a 7.3 out of 10, Honestly Nevermind gets a 6 out of 10, and Her Loss gets a 7.8 out of 10, giving the trilogy an overall 7 out of 10. Not great, but once again, a step in the right direction. Still, hopefully, Drake will be able to prove my jungle video and this video wrong. And maybe his next trilogy will be up there with his greats. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for all your support and patience. Um, I've been a lot very busy lately. I have this very big project I'm working on. I'll give more details to that later. So I'm not going to be as active with longer form videos. But I will try my best to do what I can when I can. You know, but thank you guys so much for your support recently. Like we just hit 61 subscribers, and once again, my my American Dad video is still doing pretty well. Every, everything, just thank you for everything. Thank you for anybody who's new. Thank you for everybody who's been sticking around. I really do appreciate it. I hope you all have a happy Thanksgiving. Hopefully, it's Thanksgiving by the time I upload it, and um, I'll catch you guys in my next video. I need you to come over once again. And before you give me closure Need you to come a little bit closer